FX Medicine is your gateway to news, resources and information on the safe, evidence-based approach to practising complementary and integrative medicine. Visit fxmedicine.com.au to sign up for e-news and stay up to date with the latest research, podcasts and industry information. FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. And joining me on the line again today is Dr. Elisa Song for part two of Pandas. Now, Dr. Elisa Song is a holistic pediatrician, pediatric functional medicine expert, and crazy mama to two crazy fun kids. In her integrative pediatric practice, whole family wellness, she's helped thousands of kids get to the root cause of their health concerns and helped their parents understand how to help their children to thrive, mind, body and spirit, by integrating conventional paediatrics with functional medicine, homeopathy, acupuncture, herbal medicine and essential oils. These health concerns have ranged from frequent colds, ear infections, asthma and eczema, to autism, ADHD, anxiety, depression and autoimmune illnesses. Dr. Song created Healthy Kids, Happy Kids to share her advice and adventures as a holistic paediatrician and a mama. You can follow her blog at healthykidshappykids.com and get daily tips and inspiration from her on her Facebook page. That's Dr. Elisa Song, MD. Now everyone can have their own virtual holistic paediatrician. Welcome back, Elisa, to FX Medicine. How are you? Thank you, Andrew. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm excellent. We had such a fun time in our first podcast, and of course, <laughs> you mentioned something, and I ran with the tangent. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're back for part two of pandas, and I think as a refresher, can you just remind our listeners, remind us what pandas and indeed pans are? Mm-hmm. So this is something that I believe any practitioner whether you're a functional medicine practitioner, a family practice doc, uh, a pediatrician, anyone working with children, um, therapists, psychologists should be really aware of uh, because it's increasingly common. So PANDAS, P-A-N-D-A-S, it looks like those cute little panda bears, but it stands for, it's an acronym for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcal Infections. And this condition was recognized back in, gosh, the late 80s, early 90s, where kids were presenting with this abrupt onset of severe OCD behaviors and tics um, and behavioral regressions associated with a strep infection. Now, since then, our knowledge of what PANDAS is has really broadened, and we recognize that there are many other infections that can trigger similar uh, behavioral changes and physiologic changes. And so now we call it PANS. So PANS stands for Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. Right. And it's kind of a catch-all phrase. So PANS can be infection-triggered. So PANDAS is a type of infectious-triggered PANS. Mm-hmm. But we know that other infections can definitely cause PANS as well. So these include viruses like the Epstein-Barr virus, herpes 1 and 2 virus, uh, human um, herpes virus 6, which is the roseola virus, yep. parvovirus B19, which is the slap cheek virus, Coxsackie virus, which causes hand, foot, and mouth disease, um, Lyme disease and other tick-borne infections can also trigger PANS. Um, and then we also have non-infectious triggers like environmental toxins, molds, heavy metals. But for the most part, when people are discussing PANS and PANDAS, they're really referring to infection-triggered PANS or PANDAS. And the symptoms, typically, you will see, now PANS is defined by an abrupt and dramatic onset of OCD um, or severely restrictive food intake Mm. uh, with symptoms that aren't better explained by another known neurologic order. So it's pretty sudden. And you have to have two of the of the accompanying symptoms, so anxiety, emotional lability, inner depression, irritability, and aggression, 
behavioral regression, deterioration of school performance, sensory or motor changes, and somatic signs that include sleep problems and urinary changes. Um, now, PANDAS is, of course, associated with strep, so you have to have a diagnosed strep infection. Yeah. Um, so typically, in the kids that I see, it's not a sudden onset. It can be, and yeah. it can be very dramatic, right. um, but sometimes a little more subtle. And the symptoms that I see most often are, are definitely ticks, you know, the eye blinking tick or the throat clearing tick that you think is probably allergies at first, but it doesn't stop. Um, OCD behaviors, definitely. A lot of separation anxiety. So kids who all of a sudden become more um, infantile, inability to separate from parents, talking in a baby voice, wanting to watch really young cartoons that they hadn't watched in years in their middle school. Um, handwriting, you know, watching handwriting, that significantly declines for most kids. Mm. Uh, These urinary problems, frequent urination, frequent daytime urination, um, and even enuresis. Uh, are very common. And then, of course, the more obvious ones where, you know, you'll have these kids with, you know, sudden rages and tantrums and oppositional behaviors, which are, um, can be so devastating. Um, and, and less frequently, I'll see kids who have something called misophonia or dysphonia. Um, so misophonia is basically a hatred of sound. And I have some kids with hands who literally cannot stand to hear the sound of their mother swallowing. Oh, really? So these children... Oh my gosh, this is probably the hardest one. I've had moms come in where they cannot eat with their child. And usually misophonia is directed at um, at one person. It's not a general hatred of sound, but if it's, for instance, um, you know, can't stand the sound of their mother swallowing, then they literally can't eat Eat together. I've had kids Mm -hmm. for months not be able to eat in the same room as their mother. And, you know, moms who have to wear a scarf around their neck so that their child can't see them about to swallow and even holding saliva in their mouth because their child will fly into a rage if they swallow. Oh, God. So, I mean, it's, it, you know, it can be so extreme like that. And other times it can be more subtle. Mm. But, you know, these are definitely, um, you know, kids who are sick and kids who need to be identified because we can treat them. How can I ask, we covered in our first podcast that something was triggering in my, my mind as red flag. And that was the, you know, sexual assault issues and things like that, that you've got to be able to mm-hmm. tease apart. What about stressors other than that? You know, like the stressors of daily life, just getting on top of a child and seeing regression. This seems to be something that the practitioner must be aware of to be able to say, okay, well, is it panda, uh, pandas or, or indeed pans, mm-hmm. um, or is it another stressor in life? You, you, like where do, how do you tease that apart? Indeed, things like autism, you know, like some of these behavioral traits, mm-hmm. you're reminding me of autism and ASD. So how do you tease it apart? Well, it's really interesting because, you know, my practice, I have a very large practice, um, of kids on the autism spectrum. Mm. And now that I've become more and more aware of how how common pandas and pants can be in testing many of my kids with autism, many actually do have underlying pants that may have triggered their autistic symptoms in some cases, or for some kids, because their sort of biochemical imbalances are so large and their immune systems are so dysregulated, make them more susceptible to developing pants on top of their autism. Right. Um, you know, in terms of kids who are at a baseline, though, neurotypical, and by that I mean kids who don't have diagnosed behavioral or sensory issues or, um, uh, you know, psychiatric issues, which in reality, I mean, most of us have some sort of an under, you know, we all have some sensory issues, you know, going on. Um, and I guess I would be hard pressed to find a kid if you looked at them and really thoroughly examined them and questioned them was a hundred percent quote unquote neurotypical. But mm. you have a child who is developmentally doing well, you know, seems, um, socially uh, interactive, you know, really, yeah, interactive, doing well in school, very well adjusted. And then all of a sudden there's a shift. Of mm. course, you know, we need to look for, well, what else could be going on? Is there bullying at school? Um, is there, you know, some sort of a molestation going on or an abuse? But um, as I mentioned, really, when, when we have that situation, it's typically uh, behavioral regressions all around. And oftentimes with pandas, it's really, um, well, it's interesting because for the pans, pandas kids, sometimes it would hold it together at school for a little bit, but eventually not. Right. 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 Um, 
And um, so I, I just misspoke because really with the abuse, oftentimes we'll see that it's more in one setting where there's a yes. lot of fear or yeah. a lot of regressions, right? Whereas with pandas and pans, because it's a neurologic inflammation and it's an autoimmune illness, they eventually can't hold it together anymore. So the rages happen at school and they have to have um, school accommodations and even be homeschooled in some severe cases. Mm-hmm. Um, but the interesting thing about stress, you know, as you mentioned that, uh, you know, just um, really popped a thought in my mind that for some kids, when they have pandas or pants flares, emotional stress can trigger those flares yeah. because we know that emotional stress triggers inflammatory responses in our body. Mm. Um, and so, and it can cause an immune dysregulation. And so sometimes we do see when there is a sudden, you know, breakup with a friend or a sudden huge family stressor that the behaviors start to flare. And we see when we check their antibody levels that the numbers actually are going up and it's the stress that triggers the flare. Okay. So what tips and hints and tricks can you give our listeners as practitioners to be able to look for um, when considering working up a child for pandas or pans? You know, it's interesting because when I speak with um, other practitioners here in the States, other pediatricians, there's very little awareness of what pans and pandas is and what to look for. There is there is a little bit more awareness, mm. um, and it depends on where you practice and I think, you know, what you've been exposed to, of course. Um, But I would say if you're working with kids, if you have a child who has chronic anxiety, depression, fears, OCD behaviors, or any sort of cognitive processing difficulties, Mm -hmm. especially if parents say, you know what, they were great in first grade, but all of a sudden, you know, second grade, it seemed like they were in a fog. Or second grade, they just got more fearful and separating at the door was so much harder. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the severe rages and the misophonia and the tantrums that I was mentioning before. It can, it can and usually is, when I see kids, more subtle. The sudden changes are, are, I mean, they're in a way more easy to detect because those are the kids that might even be hospitalized because they are a harm to themselves or a harm to others. And hopefully there's an astute psychiatrist or a physician involved who says, wait a second, this is too sudden. Let's look to see if this is pans or pandas. Mm. But for the kids where it's a little bit more low grade and subtle, I say just look because the more you look, the more you're going to find. And in fact, the pandas network, which is here in the United States, and it's a resource for any parent anywhere in the world, they predict that at least in the U.S., maybe as many as one in 200 kids wow. may have pandas or pans. Um, it is remarkable, you know, now um, how often when I see a little red flag or for my kiddo who has anxiety and we're trying all the right things like magnesium and maybe some 5-HTP and, you know, mindfulness and getting them into meditation, and it's just not working. Mm. And then I check for the pans or pandas tires. I realize, oh, my gosh, it's because they have pans. And unless we can get the neurologic inflammation down, we're fighting an uphill battle. And we can throw all the supplements we want, and we can try to get them into as much therapy as we want to, but they're not going to get fully well. Right, right. So I've got to tease apart something here a little bit. A lot of the infectious agents you spoke about with pans – um, you know, your Coxsackie, your um, Rubiola, things like that, they tend to be early, strep indeed, they tend to be more early childhood. But then you've got EBV, mm-hmm. which tends to be a teenager sort of thing. Admittedly, what is it, 95% of people are infected with EBV, causes no problems in most of us. So yeah. A, what age range do you see with presentation? And B, how do you tease apart... Um, uh, these as, let's say, risk factors that are definitely linked or just coincidental that they're, you know, I mean, each, each of these patients has two arms and two legs as well. So how yes, do you tease exactly. it apart and as a causatory sort of thing? Yes, you're right. And, you know, I would say the age, gosh, I mean, of course, you know, with Coxsackie and with parvovirus B19, um, herpes 6, I mean, those are often toddlers, Right, who are mm. getting those infections? Um, I do find Epstein Barr in younger and younger kids. Do you? Oh, okay. um, you know, I think because you know, probably because Epstein Barr for many kids just really looks like a sore throat and another upper respiratory infection. Um, it's more obvious in the teens when they get the the post viral fatigue syndrome. Right. Um, 
But um, what I think sometimes happens for these kids is a very common infection like herpes 6 for roseola. They get as a child and their immune system may be able to contain it for a time, but then they get these repeated hits uh, with an underlying susceptibility to autoimmune phenomena and immune dysregulation. And then eventually their immune system can't contain the infections anymore. So what we'll find, because of course, if you check most kids for Coxsackie antibodies and for herpes 6 antibodies, they'll be elevated. They'll have evidence of past infection. And of course, you know, when we check for antibodies, and this is how we know what to treat, right? We want to know when we have a child with pandas or pans, first of all, um, what's the trigger? And for these children where they have Epstein-Barr antibodies or Coxsackie antibodies, what we're looking for is not necessarily IgM elevations. Because if it was a past infection, it's possible that the IgM antibodies are still elevated, which are, of course, the antibodies for acute or ongoing infections. Mm -hmm. But very often, those IgM antibodies have really, you know, resolved. And now they're left with these IgG antibodies that are through the roof. So we know that if you have very, very elevated IgG antibodies, that represents a persistent immune activation against these infections. And there's no reason why your immune system years after having, um, you know, a mycoplasma infection or um, a CMV infection should still be churning out incredibly high levels of antibodies. Mm -hmm. So for those kids where they have very elevated antibodies, I'm highly suspicious that this represents continued immune activation and that's their trigger. And so then we start really treating, right? Um, We know that to be the case for chronic fatigue immunodeficiency syndrome where patients who are very elevated Epstein-Barr or herpes 6, I mean, those are the two most common infections associated that when they have very elevated IgG levels, if we can treat them with something like Famvir um, and bring their, or Valcite, and bring their antibody levels down to a more, quote, normal range, Mm. that corresponds with clinical improvement. Gotcha. Right? So... So yes, so um, we do want to know though what is triggering the pans or pandas. So that's the first step in really figuring out um, does a child have pandas and how do I start the treatment? Yeah, and and I guess one of those is testing. So with regards to conventional versus functional testing, there's such an array of things that you could be looking here. How do you, what do you do, and how do you balance it with cost versus bang for buck? Yes. Well, this is where, you know, I I don't know how the Australian insurance system works for laboratory testing, Mm. but most of the laboratory testing, the conventional testing for these infection um, panels uh, should be covered by insurance plans, at least here in the States. So with that, if we're looking specifically for PANDAS, the first thing we want to do is check to see, is there an active strep infection? So we're doing swabs. We're doing cultures. We're culturing not just the throat, but we're doing a nasal culture and an anal swab because the number of kids who have pandas that I see with really the the only evidence of active strep being perianal or perivaginal strep is really high. So we do want to check cultures. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, strep can be on the skin and cause the same problem. So kids with recurrent impetigo, uh, you know, that may be their source for pandas. Yeah. So it doesn't always have to be a a strep throat. Right. Um, So then in the blood, what we're checking is, of course, an anti-streptolysin O. And we're also checking for anti-DNA B strep antibodies. Mm. Now, this is an old-time antibody that is checked, you know, that... I mean, I remember in residency in medical school, we checked for the post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis that we saw as an autoimmune complication. Mm. Well, we're not seeing that anymore, but now we're seeing the shift into seeing PANDAS as the autoimmune reaction to strep. Um, so that is the anti-capital D, capital N, capital A, lowercase s, lowercase e, and the next word, just capital B, strep antibodies. And the reason I spell it out is because unless your lab is very familiar with all the tests that you run, which now my local labs are. Mm. But in the beginning, they would run an anti-DS DNA antibody. So you don't want a double-stranded DNA antibody. That's not what you're looking for. You want an anti-DNA C-strep antibody, right? And then, of course, I'm checking quantitative IgG levels to herpes 6, herpes 1 and 2, mycoplasma pneumonia, Epstein-Barr virus, parvovirus B19, Coxsackie virus A and B, CMV, cytomegalovirus, 
and also measles, mumps, and rubella if they've received the MMR or have had um, actual infection. Um, you can look also to, to, to see this list. You don't have to memorize this, but in 2013, a PANS consensus statement was written and published in the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychopharmacology, where you know many of the experts in PANS and PANDAS treatments across the country developed a consensus statement for practitioners to know, well, where should we start the testing? And how do we go about thinking about the physical exam for these kids um, and, get, and eliciting a really great history, including a family history? So that's really the conventional testing. Now, in terms of additional functional medicine testing, of course, the cost varies widely. Mm. And here in the States, some of that is covered by insurance, some isn't. It can Yes, absolutely get quite costly. Um, one of the tests that we have available in the States um, relatively recently in the last you know couple of years is something called the Cunningham Panel. Uh, I'm not sure if it's available in Australia, but if practitioners look up the Cunningham Panel, and it is offered by a lab called Moleculera, M-O-L-E-C-U-L-E-R-A, Moleculera Labs. And these are a set of four autoantibodies that were identified uh, as uh, being highly elevated in patients with PANDAS and PANS. So I don't, this is certainly not a first line test. However, I do check the Cunningham panel in patients who are quote zero negative, right? We don't find any elevated titers for any infections, but we're still highly suspicious for PANDAS or PANS. Um, and oftentimes we will see elevated levels. And it's really interesting. What they test for are two different types of dopamine receptors, the uh, anti-dopamine receptor uh, D1 and D2L. I see there are five markers. So that, that autoantibody, also a lyoganglioside uh, autoantibody. So the lyoganglioside are molecules in the, the brain cell membranes and, and nerve membranes that aid in that sort of nerve-to-nerve -nerve communication. So you can imagine if your antibodies are attacking that, how erratic your <laughs> brain wave and brain cell communication would be. Um, and then tubulin, right, anti-tubulin antibodies, which of course are the protein that really help to maintain the neuron's cellular structure. So those are the four autoantibodies, and they also check something called a CAM kinase 2 activity. So CAM kinase 2 stands for calcium and calmodulin-dependent protein kinase 2. And they found that a high activity of this enzyme, it's an enzyme, it can cause um, a ton of overstimulation and overexcitation in the brain. So it's a useful test if your pans and panis titers are negative. Um, I don't test it too often because it is quite expensive, although more, more and more insurance companies I'm finding are actually covering a portion of the test. Right. So in terms of functional medicine testing, the two tests that I do do are, uh, number one, of course, a comprehensive digestive stool analysis. And I'm sure that that's where most of our functional medicine practitioners start because any immune dysregulation is going to start with the gut. But my interest, too, in not just assessing gut regulation um, is really looking specifically at their culture and seeing, do they have strep species in their gut? Because we often find gamma strep and alpha strep species that are not considered pathogenic. Right. However, if you have a child with pandas in particular, uh, where they are mounting an autoimmune response to strep anywhere in their body, then we need to clear that strep from their gut as well. So that's a very helpful test to do, especially if you're getting stuck where you're seeing some improvements, but you're not getting the improvements that you're hoping for. And then the last test that I find very useful, especially if I'm, I'm really trying to assess, is this a child with pandas or pans? Is this something that I should pursue further? Mm. Is a urine organic acid test. Right. And in that urine organic acid test, of course, there's so many valuable markers for our children with chronic illnesses and really anyone with chronic illness, including the mitochondrial markers and the methylation markers. But what I'm looking specifically for is their quinolinic acid. Gotcha. Because when quinolinic acid is very elevated, especially in relation to kynurenic acid, that can give me an indication that there is neuroinflammation. And those patients, I absolutely dig further in to the PANDAS and PANS testing. Now, you can have PANDAS and PANS without an elevated quinolinic acid, but it's, it's a tip-off. 
So if you're working up a child, let's say with autism, who comes to you for a biomedical functional medicine approach uh, to treat their autism, and they are, um, you get a urine organic acid test as part of your initial battery of tests, and their quinolinic acid is very high, then I know, okay, you know what, rather than the pans pandas testing being lower on my list and maybe several visits down, I'm going to start doing that right away. So that's just another little kind of um, red flag yeah, of what you should be looking. Yeah. So, so do you look at high quinolinic acid on its own or high quinolinic to kynurenic acid ratio? Both. I look at both. Um, you know, the, the ratio is probably more important, but uh, but if the quinolinic acid is very high, then then I still want to gotcha. know, yeah. is, there, <laughs> is there something going on there? And of course, I'm picking up this sort of kind of a crossover with maybe things like um, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, like the SIRS of Richie Shoemaker. Is that, do you see this sort of thing? Like when you're talking about it as a mold, as a, an antecedent to the triggering of the symptoms, do you, do you find the, the supportive measures can be as complex, if you like, as um, something like people with SIRS? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, you know, mold can be one of those pants triggers. Remember I mentioned that PANS can be infection triggered or, or mm. non-infectious triggered. And so we do find for some kids where it's not any infection that we can find, but, you know, they have a huge amount of mold in their home. And, you know, uh, many of the labs, if you run the Shoemaker panel, are really abnormal. So then we have to start working on really uh, treating the mold toxicity. And that's how you're going to get rid of that neurologic inflammation and that autoimmune response that's going on. You know, podcasting with such experts in this area as um, Nicole Bildsma, and uh, she was talking about building biology. Uh, and her expertise has just blown the lid off. If a, a, a massive problem that I see in Australia, don't know about the US, I would say it's just as bad, but I was totally unprepared for the amount of buildings that have mold damage. And that, so therefore the amount of risk that we're placing these kids who have got a propensity for PANS under, you know, it's huge. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes we find that kids do have infectious triggered PANS, but and they're getting better, but something's holding them in place. Mm. And so then we have to look at, well, what are the perpetuating factors, right? right? We talk about the triggers, but then there can also be perpetuating factors. And that's anything that's going to be creating additional inflammation. Um, and so that's absolutely an important piece in your treatment plan to figure out. Mm. So key functional medicine and supportive interventions. I, I'm I'm ready for about an hour long podcast right here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm suspecting that it's going to be way too much to cover in a short podcast. But can you give us some hints and tips as to what are your favorites or most commonly used, um, uh, you know, uh, um, interventions? And indeed, which ones do you find more successful? Maybe even comparing to things that you find useless. Yes. So, you know, now once you've figured out what you're treating, right, what bugs you're killing, and here I'm going to be mostly referring to infectious triggered pans and pandas because that is more, much more common than non-infectious triggered pans. Yeah. So once you know what the bug is, mm. the basic principles are first to kill the bugs. <laughs> yeah. The second is to put the fire out however you can. And the third one is really keeping that fire down, right? And finally, we, of course, in, in any intervention that we do, we really need to know how to support the child and family through this process and through the flares. So the first step, you know, killing the bug, I would say that's the easiest thing, right, for the most part, right? Because <laughs> we, we know what herbal and pharmaceutical antimicrobials will probably work. Hmm. So once you know, is this a mycoplasma, you know, bacteria, is it strep, is it um, Epstein-Barr, then you uh, really use the appropriate antimicrobial, um, whether or not you choose to use pharmaceuticals or herbal antimicrobials. Now, azithromycin, when it comes to strep-induced pans or pandas or mycoplasma-induced pans, um, is a great choice. Um, azithromycin by itself actually has its own anti-inflammatory properties. Mm. And a recent study, this is just last year in 2016, found azithromycin to be very helpful for kids with sudden onset of OCD and ticks. Um, so even, even without pandas, azithromycin can be helpful. Um, 
you know, as far as herbal antimicrobials, I have some combinations that I use and really like. I don't know if they're available uh, in in Australia, but of course, for viral uh, infections, olive leaf extract is works great. Ah. Uh, typically, with herbals, most herbal um, regimens do require more than one antimicrobial agent. Yeah. So if I'm doing olive leaf extract, I might also add some lauricidin uh, for its antiviral properties and maybe some L-lysine. Mm. Um, the benefit of an antimicrobial herbal regimen, in my mind, is because oftentimes for kids, they don't just have one bug. Yeah. We often find that they have strep and they have really elevated herpes 6 titers. And so now you have an antibiotic and, you know, like azithromycin and maybe acyclovir or, you know, fam beer that you have to add on board. So if you use an antimicrobial herbal cocktail, then you can actually have both antibacterial and antiviral properties. And then at the same time, you have the antifungal properties to prevent the yeast overgrowth that we see if you just use antibiotics alone. So there is a benefit to using antimicrobial herbs. Uh, I typically, though, you know, for a kid with pandas, um, or with uh, mycoplasma pneumonia pans, I will use the pharmaceutical. I just I, they do tend to work a little bit more quickly, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you know follow up with antimicrobial herbs. Um, you know, in terms of length of time, that's a hard one. I mean, most of these kids, we think probably until they. Uh, hit puberty and beyond, and when their immune system really starts to act more like a mature adult-like immune system, we need to support them with some sort of an antimicrobial. And I, I really, you know, do, don't like the idea of keeping kids on antibiotic prescriptions for years and years and years. However, sometimes it is necessary. Mm. But that's where if we can get them on antimicrobial herbs, because many of these herbs also have good phytonutrient properties and antioxidant properties uh, themselves. So, but I do tell parents, expect to be on some sort of an antimicrobial cocktail for a prolonged period. Yeah. Um, I don't like to give specific dates, but it's typically going to be, you know, a matter of years. Um, and we can shorten that duration once they're in a good place. Sometimes we'll go to a more prophylactic regimen of, um, you know, every other day and then every few days and once a week for the antibiotics um, and, and see how they do. Oftentimes, you do need to change the antibiotics. Yes. So this was where I was going to head is, is given that you're dealing with kids often you know, in this situation, um, mm -hmm. you know, you're talking about a pneumonia mycoplasma type issue, doxycycline is used in adults, but there are certain issues with doxy in kids with teeth development, right? So is this where you yes, pr um, prefer azithromycin over doxy? That's right. right. That's right. Yeah, we don't use doxy. You know, there are some indications where if that's your only choice, you can use. Yeah. Um, and for instance, with Lyme, I might go to the doxy a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, um, going for the azithromycin and for other antibiotics is, is preferred if you have young kids. Yeah. Okay. So the typical course for a child, are we talking, you know, you mentioned months, years here. Um, yes. That's yeah. going to be frustrating as hell when you're looking at academic performance and how they're developing socially in school, um, indeed setting up their friendships yep. and how they're going to be as a person later on in life. What's the typical course for a child with pandas and pans? How does it change and what can they expect? What, what can parents sort of expect to, to come back to, if you like? Oh, gosh. The typical course, you know, it does vary and, uh, you know, it can be heartbreaking. But mm. before we get into that, let me back up and just um, go into some of the other things to really help kids get more stable, right? Because in the beginning, when we're seeing a kid with pans or pandas, we really, you know, want to get them into a stable place so that we don't see a lot of flares. And if we can do that, then they have a much easier course. Because once you kill the bugs, pandas and pans can flare and can flare quite often and can be really devastating. And so when I mentioned putting out the fire, you know, lowering the inflammation, we need to do that as well. You can't just kill the infection, you know, fight the bugs and the microbes without getting the fire in their brain down. And of course, you know, we all have our favorite anti-inflammatories, but, um, you know, essential um, are the omega-3 essential fatty acids uh, to really help with the inflammation. Curcumin is one of my favorite because curcumin can cross the blood-brain barrier where we want the inflammation to go down. Uh, and then another favorite is quercetin. So quercetin has mast uh, cell stabilizing properties to prevent histamine release. And we know for many 
kids and adults with chronic infections, histamine intolerance is a huge issue and histamine release is a huge problem. And so we have histamine receptors on every single cell Mm. in our body and Mm. we have these relatively newly identified H4 receptors on our immune cells. Of course, we we all know about our H1 uh, receptors and our H2 receptors that are responsible for allergies and and reflux, but Mm. we have H3 receptors in our brain and H4 receptors on our immune cells. So if we can stabilize, you know, that histamine release and really modulate how our immune cells and our CNS cells are working, that's going to go a long way in lowering the inflammation. Um, You've just given me a new then, subject to re- research tonight. <laughs> I know nothing <laughs> of H4. <laughs> yes, it's fascinating. Mm. I started looking into this. Why are kids having these histamine problems? And it just makes so much sense. I mean, these histamine receptors are everywhere, and histamine is so such an important modulator of virtually every uh, action in our body, including our, our immune cells. So, um, yes. That can be absolutely probably another topic for a huge podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, massive. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I, I never leave the discussion uh, with parents without talking about their diet. Yep. They have to clean yep. up their diet yep. and remove any inflammatory triggers. And that almost always is gluten. Um, and for our kids, you know, absolutely, if they get rid of all that artificial junk, the dyes, the artificial flavors, and the artificial preservatives, because those are feeding the fire. So whatever fuel is feeding the fire, we need to get rid of. Um, and for the, for cases where they are having a lot of inflammation, what I typically start with is um, a week's worth of ibuprofen, you know, at anti-inflammatory doses. So, yeah. you know, 10 mg per kg per dose three times a day for a week. And that can do wonders for calming that child and regulating their behaviors. And this is a little test I might do if I'm not quite sure. We're in the process of working up for PANS and we're needing to wait two weeks for the titers. After the blood is drawn, I'll tell parents, you know what, let's just try this. Give some ibuprofen for a week and you let me know what their behaviors are like. And if they say, oh my gosh, they're so much calmer. They stopped wetting the bed. Their handwriting is getting better. Well, they have PANS. You, now you just need wow. to figure out what's causing it. Wow. Um, so here, here, I've got another issue here, is that given the new flavour of the month using NSAIDs in kids for fevers, um, mm. because, mm-hmm. you know, paracetamol overdose is the most common drug overdose of paediatrics seen in hospitals, yeah. Yeah. and people can't read labels, um, and so now they're <laughs> turning to the next flavour of the month. Oh, I'm just w- waiting for two things. One would they be covering up a panda's pans issue? And two, I'm just waiting for the day that we're going to see a whole population basis of childhood ulceration, um, it's yes. a stomach yeah. ulceration. I'm just waiting. Um, yes. And that, you know, that's a, that's a great point because really, you know, and said you should not be prolonged if you can help it. And of course it's going to disrupt the gut microbiome and the pH of your gut and have tons of downstream effects. Mm. And so it's not something that I would like it to be on long term. Yeah. Um, you know, the issue with fever that, I mean, I have long conversations about fever with families and with other practitioners because there's way too much fever phobia. And I remind parents that Fever is your body's natural response to fighting that infection. I say very simplistically, what happens when you're hot? You slow down. So when your body heats up, it's slowing down those bugs so your immune system can actually kill them. And we know there are studies showing that artificially, you know, using fevers with antipyretics like acetaminophen and ibuprofen actually prolongs the duration of the illness. So you may temporarily be helping your child to feel better but you are prolonging uh, their illness and you're not helping them fight their infection any better. So if we can just sit tight and reserve the NSAIDs for when their kids are not drinking very well or not sleeping well, because you need to drink and sleep to recover, but otherwise really, you know, letting that fever run its course, you know, if you are neurologically intact, I remind parents, your your body has these thermoregulatory control mechanisms that your fever will not get, quote, too high. And you, your child will not get brain damage. And children also often run, you know, to 39 degrees Celsius, 39.5, you know, 40, mm. you know, very, mm. very quickly. And they're running around and they're talking to you. <laughs> yeah. You know, an, an adult at 38.5, you know, it's acting like it's the end of the world. Particular, right? Particularly a mile. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 
but but kids are different. Just on that on that line though, when do you worry about um, um, fitting with a fever? So with a fever, you know, I, I tell parents look at your child. If they are more tired, but they're making good eye contact, they're answering your questions appropriately, they're staying hydrated, meaning they're having some urine output every six to eight hours, even if it's a little darker or a little bit less in volume, um, then that's what I want to see. Many kids, you know, and and there are going to be some kids who are, you know, 38.3 and they're laying on the couch listless. And again, other kids who are 39 and they're you know, playing volleyball and running around like nothing's going on. So looking at your child is really important. Um, so no matter what temperature, if they are not making great eye contact, not answering your questions appropriately, they're dehydrated and you're really monitoring the urine output to see that they really truly are, quote, lethargic. Lethargic is a word I tell parents not to use <laughs> unless they are truly lethargic, <laughs> meaning they're on the couch and very difficult to arouse, Right. <laughs> lethargic does not mean just wanting to be a couch potato. Not, not putting the bins right? out, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so, and I tell parents, I want your child to be a couch potato when they're sick. I do not want them acting, quote, normal, because parents will worry, well, they're not acting their normal self. Mm. Well, when you're sick, you should hunker down, That's you should right. cover yourself with a blanket, drink some warm soup, and rest. Yep. You should not be, you know, running around the backyard on the trampoline or riding bicycles with your friends. Yeah. So, oh, and just, you know, just a, another um, uh, step that I sometimes do take with bringing down the inflammation um, are steroid pulses. Now, you know, again, I do not use steroids, prednisone lightly. However, just as you might with a child with a very severe asthma flare, you might do consider a four or five day course a steroids, two milligrams per kilogram per day, in which case you wouldn't have to do a taper. Now, in some kids, severe cases, I have had kids on steroids with longer tapers, you know, sometimes a month-long taper. Um, and some kids who are very sick might even be on a longer taper. Um, but that is something, if you are having trouble getting the fire down, we want to get the fire down whatever way we can to get kids feeling better, um, behaving better, functioning better, and then we keep the fire down. And this is where conventional medicine has very little to offer, unfortunately. We're good at blasting immune systems, right? We're good at, you know, giving all sorts of immunosuppressants to, to bring the fire down. But we don't have a lot of ways to keep the fire down. And this is where um, we have some fascinating interventions in the functional medicine world to think about, well, how can we apply what we know of pathophysiology and what's going on with this illness to think theoretically about what nutraceutical or, or pharmaceutical might be beneficial. And in our first talk, we spoke about this TH17 imbalance. Yeah. Right. And so we know that with PANDAS now, uh, we're finding it's, it's a TH17 upregulation with insufficient T regulatory support. So then, then I think, well, gosh, what can help increase T regulatory support? Well, you know, things like vitamin D and butyrate, mm-hmm. you know, that we find mm-hmm. in ghee or pistachios, if you like pistachios, and exercise and vitamin A can all enhance our T regulatory function. Yes. Um, so there are uh, our do you, uh-huh. Sorry, do you, so do you find a resurgence in the use of vitamin A? We were so paranoid about it for so many decades. <laughs> and yet you, when you're yeah. looking at Treg, and, you know, it's used even in neurotransmitter production, um, vitamin A, retinol, has a really good um, purpose, a therapeutic action. Absolutely. You know, I'm, I, there is still a fear of vitamin A here. <laughs> yeah. I won't lie. It's it's not, it's, there's not a resurgence except, you know, in the, func- in the autism world and the functional medicine world a bit more. Um, I have had kids on fairly high dose vitamin A protocols for antiviral support. And I, you know, I, I'm following levels and not a single one has become toxic. Mm. So, you know, yes, we do need to worry about vitamin A toxicity, but it takes a lot, a lot. to get there. Indeed. indeed um, what is it? The World Health Organization um, International Vitamin A Working Group, I think it was IVAG. Um, you know, what is it? It's safe to, for a pregnant woman to take 10,000 IU. Now, this is not retinol equivalents. This is IU, international units. Um, mm-hmm. 10,000 IU at any stage during pregnancy, regardless of her existing status. 
So in other words, mm -hmm. she could be already replete and she can take an extra 10,000 without causing birth defects. That's International That's Vitamin right. A Working Group. Right. Now you've got to think about pediatrics and the, you know, the, the doses used are, are massive. Um, when I looked at toxicity, it was huge. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the, you know, the other thing we had spoken about in terms of um, TH17 is really, you know, I, I started looking at, well, are there ways that we can actually lower TH17 responses? And there's, there's an uh, antioxidant called Fisetin. F is in Frank, I, S is in Sam, E, T is in Tom, I, N. And I've only begun to use this in a few patients, and I've actually had some some pretty good feedback on it. So this is a naturally occurring antioxidant that's found in um, high levels in strawberries and, you know, other other fruits and vegetables like apples and onions mm. and lotus root of all things, if you eat lotus root and persimmons. Um, but Fisetin has been found to inhibit TH17. Ah. So that's another promising area for intervention. Um, now the other, you know, the other two, actually other three interventions that if, if in Australia you have access to, to highly consider, the first one is low dose naltrexone. Right. So I don't know if any of your practitioners are using low dose naltrexone for autoimmune illnesses, but I am seeing great results with low dose naltrexone in my kids with Panis and pans, and frankly, any autoimmune condition. What are, so uh, where so, I'm going here with this, with low dose naltrexone, this is a drug in Australia, so obviously prescribed by a GP. Um, and mm -hmm. I don't know about its appropriate use. It would be an off label use for this sort of thing. So I don't know where that sits with GPs. But um, where I'm thinking here is things like SIBO. So you know, naltrexone is really interesting because, of course, um, naltrexone in in quote, regular doses or the doses that physicians really know the use of naltrexone for is as an opioid antagonist in cases of overdose, right? And so when parents look it up, they'll, they'll say, well, my child doesn't take narcotics, right? But in low doses, and these are extremely low doses, and, and we do have to get it compounded here. So there are special compounding pharmacies that I, I will call on the prescription for, but there are opioid receptors on all of our immune cells. And so what we're finding is if you give naltrexone at these very low dosages at bedtime, there is a temporary blockade of something called opioid growth factor on some of these immune cells for a few hours overnight. Mm -hmm. And then in the morning, you get this rebound sensitivity of those immune cells with increased effects on immune modulation, because that's what we want with our kids with autoimmune illnesses and our adults with autoimmune illnesses. We want to modulate their immune response so it's a more normal immune response. It's not fire out of control. Um, and Jackie McCandless is a physician who, in the early 2000s, really pioneered work with low-dose naltrexone with kids on the autism spectrum. And uh -huh. I remember back then, I tried low-dose naltrexone for several of my kids on the spectrum, and I didn't see anything. Mm. I didn't see any wows. Mm. But now that I'm going back to it and targeting the right kids, and I realize I was not targeting the right child with autism. Right. Because autism has so many different paths. Yeah, yeah. And not all kids with autism have an infectious path. But the kids who do now and the kids with pants and pants, it is a game changer for some of those kids. And, you know, the typical dosage for adults with autoimmune illness, we're getting them to about four and a half milligrams. So very low dosages and it has to be given at bedtime. For children, you know, I'll start at a very low dose, even a half a milligram and end up anywhere from one and a half to three or three and a half milligrams. And the interesting thing is, you know, it doesn't necessarily correspond with their body weight. Right. Which we know, right? If In the field of pharmacogenetics, yep. it doesn't make sense to just purely base your dosing on body weight. No. So you just have to titrate up slowly and see. Yeah. So start at 0.5 um, and go up to around about the three. Around about three. Mm -hmm. mm. And then if in Australia you have a severe kid with PANS or PANDAS, one of the interventions that has actually um, quite a bit of good uh, literature support for is IV immunoglobulin, IVIG. So, you know, this is not to be taken lightly. No. IVIG can definitely have side effects. <laughs> Hell yeah. and, um, and yes, and absolutely, it's, it's invasive, requires IV treatments over several hours. However, for your severe kids with PANDAS it can, and PANS, it can do an immune reset. How do you get that accepted? Like you'd have to have a specialist, you're a pediatrician, obviously, but 
how would it, like a GP, that they'd, they'd need specialist intervention for that, wouldn't they? You know, it depends. Yeah. Here in the States, you can, I as a physician can order IVIG on a patient. It does have to go through insurance approval. And unfortunately, most insurance companies, if you have um, any diagnosis of PANDAS or PANS in the chart, they will automatically deny IVIG. Oh, really? Even though, you know, there are several studies showing the benefits of IVIG, you know, as early, you know, as late as August of 2016, mm. last year, Sue Suido is a doctor at the National Institute of uh, Mental Health, and she really pioneered this work, you know, way back in the 90s um, with, with PANDAS. Uh, but they found that those children who received IVIG had over a 60% reduction in PANDAS symptoms. And oftentimes, it's just a one-time IVIG dose. It's not, uh, you know, monthly, which we used yeah, to think kids yeah. needed. Um, now what I do is I, I do check kids for their total IgG levels and their quantity and their subclasses because very often kids will have low immunoglobulin type G levels. Okay. And is that, you know, is it a chicken or an egg thing? I yeah. don't know because with chronic immune stress over time, you can expect your white blood cell count to drop and mm. your neutrophil uh, count to drop and you can expect your IgG levels to drop. However, there are some kids who actually have Com combined variable immunodeficiency and other primary immunodeficiencies that we know are more likely to develop PANS or PANDAS. So if I can find a low IgG number, that's a little bit more of a push for insurance to approve it. Now, if it's going to be a one-time thing, unfortunately, I've had parents who just have to pay out of pocket. It's incredibly expensive, yeah. but it can be very worth it, especially when you're getting stuck. Now, the dosage for IVIG for PANDAS and PANS treatment, and this may um, really caused some practitioners' jaws to drop <laughs> because the replacement dose for immune um, IgG replacement mm. is about 500 milligrams per kilogram. Now, the treatment dose for PANS and PANDAS is two grams per kilogram wow. given over two days. So it's one gram per kilo daily for two days. You do not want to give a low-dose replacement dose because they found that that actually can worsen PANDAS. Right. So that's a consideration. Yeah, I wonder if then you might have answered my question here, and that was to do you ever think about using, given that it's not IV, it's oral dosing, but do you ever use things like colostrum with, um, you know, high IgA, IgG? Yeah, you know, that's a great thought. And I do use colostrum and IgG um, proteins. Uh, several supplement manufacturers now have IgG available as a supplement, mm -hmm. um, and that can be very helpful. That seems to have more benefit for the gut. So for kids who have the inflammatory yep. and irritable bowel symptoms, um, I haven't found it to be that helpful for the pandas or pan symptoms, but of gotcha. course, all of these kids have dysregulated guts. Hmm. So that would be very helpful hmm. um, to support their guts so that they don't get new infections in the first place. Um, right. So that's, you know, that, you know, I do use that as supportive. And in fact, there's one supplement called um, IGY Max. It's actually an egg. Oh derived IgG that has, there are some good studies looking at its uh, effect on preventing recurrent strep infections. So that is one that I do use more frequently for kids who have pandas. Gotcha. Obviously, we need to get you out to Australia to teach our practitioners. This is a specialist sort of area. I mean, this is something where you can't just go, oh, I'm going to treat it tomorrow. You really know what you, you really need mm -hmm. to know what you're, what you're dealing with and how to treat and how to handle untowards effects. What resources exist for practitioners to upskill in this area, though? So there are, you know, unfortunately, I will say there aren't a ton of resources for practitioners to get trained. Mm. This is, you know, you need to have that foundation of functional medicine and really have that foundation of um, working with kids the, uh, on the autism spectrum through mm. a biomedical approach, mm. even if your kids aren't on the autism spectrum, because the foundations, the biochemical imbalances that we see are often very similar. Mm. So if you are a practitioner working with kids on the autism spectrum and you are comfortable with a biomedical approach, then absolutely this is something you can start doing because we, you do need to have that foundation and we need to provide all those same functional medicine supports at the very least, right? We need to address their leaky gut and their gut dysbiosis. We need to support methylation and mitochondrial support is critical. Most of these kids have nutrient deficiencies. And we were talking before, you know, we got onto the podcast about adrenal and thyroid dysfunction, mm. but absolutely these kids need to be supported fully. Otherwise they're not going to get better. Yeah. Um, and so if you start from there and then you do the testing and see, well, what infections could be underlying, um, 
then what you can do is go to the um, Pandas Physicians Network. So the Pandas Physicians Network is a UAS-based um, network. It, the website is www.pandas, P-A-N-D-A-S, P-P-N, so Pandas Physicians Network. Dot org, and they have you know the latest research on um, on their website. They have some workup guidelines and some treatment guidelines on their website. Um, it's not a training program, but they do also hold yearly conferences. So if anyone is interested in coming to the Great. states, I'm happy to see them and say hi. But <laughs> but those are um, conferences where you can get more training from people who are specializing in pandas. Um, and then for parents, and even if you're not a parent as a practitioner, really, uh, you know, new to this idea of PANIS and PANS and really wanting to learn more about its impact on families and what other parents are trying and doing and have found successful, the PANDAS Network, that's www.pandasnetwork.org, um, is a great resource. And of course, you know, I learn the most from my families and from my parents. Um, it is often, you know, it is the mamas and some papas, but it's usually the mamas mm, yes. <laughs> who are up all night doing research, Googling on their Facebook groups, you know, on their listservs, searching for answers. And they will come to me and say, have you heard of such and such? Someone on my board is getting good success with this, you know, this medication or that um nutritional supplement. And then I do my research and look into it to see, is this a plausible, um, you know, uh, therapeutic to try, Yeah. right? Because our kids can't wait for all the evidence, but if there's a plausibility of evidence uh, that it may be helpful and that it's not going to be harmful, then we work it through it together. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And that's how you learn. Well, we'll definitely be putting pandasppn.org and pandasnetwork.org up on the FX Medicine website for our listeners. So if any of you listeners out there would like to access those resources, please do so. And indeed, I'll be putting up a whack of papers. My goodness. <laughs> I think I'll <laughs> And just... I can get you some resources too. Yeah, thanks. I just, you know, as a very <laughs> final note, you know, for your for your functional medicine practitioners who are have delved into pandas and pans um, or chronic infections of any sort. Um, if you know you can get your kids better, it is amazing how well kids can get. It's a bumpy road because kids absolutely will flare at one point or two points or three points. Mm. So then you're just going back to supporting their inflammation, bringing down the fire, um, supporting their gut. Um, and then, you know, there are times though where you might get stuck, right? And some kids you're doing all these treatments and you're not making any headway and you've done the IVIG, you've even done maybe something called plasmapheresis at a specialty hospital. Um, and in those cases, I just want to plant a little seed for those practitioners to really think about biofilms yes, right. and also about, um, immune activation of the hypercoagulability cascade so ah. that there can be the secondary hypercoagulability that's also holding infections in place. So Related to serotonin at, you know, or? No, it's actually related to chronic infections. Infections, you know, these, right. These, these pathogens are really smart, and they not just create biofilms around themselves to evade our immune system, but they also can literally activate our coagulation cascade huh. and create these little fibrin clots around themselves. Right. And so you have a secondary hypercoagulability. Gotcha. So as soon as you can break through the biofilm or break through those clots, you have to be ready for a deluge of pathogens. So you need to be ready to mop that up, but then you get the movement if, you're, if your child's stuck calling on Helen Patteron and Alessandra Edwards here, <laughs> two practitioners that <laughs> specialise in the treatment of biofilms. Um, Dr. Yeah. Lisa Song, I can't thank you enough for taking us through, me through. I mean, wow. Uh, obviously, your expertise is evident, but I love the way that you care about your kids. You can see, I can, you know, just see you going back to little stories, little patients that you've um, had interactions with and, you know, they're triggering how something worked or didn't work in them. And I can just see your mind flicking back to people um, <laughs> that you've helped. You're obviously a lovely mama. And I, I, like I seriously, I can't wait oh, to learn you. more from you. I thank you so much for taking me through 
um, what pandas and pans are, because I had no idea. I'm certainly going to be learning more tonight. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> you know, we always learn, right? I mean, you Very never true. stop learning, which is why this field is so exciting. Very true. And I'll certainly be learning more about H4 receptors tonight. Dr. Elisa Song, thank you so yeah. much for taking us through pandas and pans on FX Medicine today. Oh, you're so welcome. It was a pleasure to be with you twice. I love talking to you. It's super fun. And, you know, in closing, I just wanted to uh, give two more resources yep. for practitioners and for parents. I think it can be really eye-opening for practitioners who have never um, seen a patient. Well, I, I will say they probably have seen a patient with pandas or pans and not realized it, but haven't, haven't really thought about what it could be and how it can manifest. There is a documentary film called My Kid Is Not Crazy that is it's heart-wrenching on some levels and but it just gives an insight into what these families are going through and how much they need help from from you all listening as functional medicine practitioners yes. to um, learn more about how to help them and then there's a book that I have all my kids read it's called in a pickle over pandas and it's amazing because kids will come in, I'll tell them that I think they might have an infection that's really causing their brain to hurt and causing them to do things that they really don't want to do. Um, and then they'll read it and just you can see and parents will tell, call me and say they just start you know, really crying in tears saying, this is me. You know, I'm so glad I'm not crazy, right? And now I know there's something that's wrong and something that we can do. So it's a great book for um, kids to read, but you know, any parent or practitioner who just wants to see, well, from a kid's perspective, what does it feel like and what are they going through? Mm. Um, it, it's a wonderful resource. Dr. Elisa Song, I can't thank you enough for your heart. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. If you're loving our FX Medicine podcasts, please don't forget to share us with your colleagues, family, and friends. Don't forget to visit fxmedicine.com.au for today's show notes, extra research and other resources.